the Health and Social Care Scrutiny Commission. My name is Councillor Victoria Elisa. I'm the Chair of the Health and Social Care Scrutiny Commission. Before we start, I've got a few announcements as, as usual. As you know, this meeting is being recorded by the Council and, it's, and it will be uploaded to Southwark Council's YouTube channel by tomorrow, end of play tomorrow. Please note all guests will have their microphones muted when they join the meeting. You'll be asked to remain on mute unless you're invited to speak. Please wait until I've given you permission to speak before unmuting your microphone. Um, and obviously in this strange time, to ensure that this virtual meeting runs smoothly, only one person should speak at a time. So please allow people to speak and finish what they're saying um, without interruption. Um, if I request that individuals start speaking, they should do so immediately. Um, if a member of the Commission wishes to speak, could I ask them to indicate this via the chat function or to raise their hands in the chat function? Um, please not. OK, just bear with me. Sorry. Apologies for that. Apologies for that. Um, please note that all guests have been made attendees after the event of the meeting. A message should now have shown on your screen to indicate this has been done. Bearing in mind that um, a recording of this meeting will be posted on the Council's YouTube channel. If you're planning to speak at this mute meeting, you may choose to switch off your camera. That's your choice so that only your voice will be heard. Um, Members of the public who are disconnected from this meeting due to technical difficulties should use the link or dial-in instructions um, they were sent initially to return to this meeting. So if every member of the commission or officer loses internet connection, please inform Fitzroy Williams or Julie Trimble via email with Microsoft Teams immediately and they'll try to restore your connection as soon as possible. Um, Members of the public are welcome to record, screenshot or tweet the public proceedings of this meeting and a copy of our council, the council's protocol for reporting and filming is available on the Southwark website. And finally, in the interest of health and safety, what I will be doing is what I did last month was when it gets to about eight o'clock or just before eight, I'll be having a 10 minute comfort break because I realise doing these um, conference calls just to give people some time for a comfort break. Um, and there you go. OK, so if we go on to um, the agenda, do we have any apologies for absence, Ju Julie? No, OK. No, I we don't have any. Sorry. We don't have any. All I've got, I've got one um, apologies for lateness. That's from Councillor Helen Dennis, who will join us at 7.30. OK, um, can we confirm the voting members? Um, please introduce yourself when I call your name. Is Councillor David Noakes there, Vice Chair? Hello, Chair. Yes, I'm present. So I've uh, joined oh, slightly just can't see you. late because I was um, oh. on the youth, the youth violence panel. Before oh, okay. This okay. Okay. I've just seen you just now. Your picture, your face has just come up. Um, as I said, Councillor Helen Dennis, she's going to be late. She'll join us at seven thirty. And Councillor Paul Fleming, he's not here. And Councillor Maria Lingford Hall, here. Thank you. Councillor um, Darren Merrill. Yes, Chair, I'm here. I have to apologise if I put the video on, it cuts me off. So, all oh, right, okay. You won't be able to see my lovely face this evening. <laughs> we can hear you, thank you. And last but not least, Councillor Charlie Smith. Yes, I'm here, Chair, if you can hear me, yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Correct, sir. Thank you. No. Okay. Um, notifications of any items of business which the Chair deems urgent? I don't think there's none at the moment. Um, is there any declarations of interest and dispensations from any member? No, OK. OK, if we go to the minutes of the last meeting held on the 22nd of June, um, has everyone got a copy of that so you can have a look and see whether, um, is that a two? Who is actually there? Um, let me see. Um, has everyone got access to the minutes of the last meeting? 22nd of June? OK. Yes, Chair. OK, so can we agree that was accurate record? Yeah? Yes, Chair. Thank yes, you. Chair. OK, can we go on to um, item five, which is impact of COVID-19 on residents? So item five, yeah? Hi. Hi. Um, 
So this this is me. Yes, that's correct. Yep. Um, so I'm Nancy Cushman. I'm a GP. I'm one of the CCG clinical leads that represents Southwark at the South East London CCG. And I also chair the borough based board, which is the local um, entity that the CCG delegates to commission um, health services out of the hospital. Um, so I just I just wanted to I have a declaration of interest um, that is recorded with the CCG, but just for those of you who are unaware, my husband is a Southwark councillor and sometimes that's important for people to know. Um, I am going to talk uh, about some slides which have been sent through so that I believe there are six slides and the papers called Southwark Scrutiny Committee submission. It may have the word S, the letters SH. Yeah, that's it. Oh, you've got three. Right. That's easier. Um, and I and I'm to be honest, I'm not going to sort of read them out. I didn't write them. They were written by Sam Hepplewhite, who's on leave and asked me to help um, to kind of basically to help uh, guide and respond to questions. So um, this bit, let me go to the, there we go. Um, I think you asked a bit about what kind of health services were running during the COVID pandemic. Um, yeah. And these three slides summarise what um, has continued. So I will quickly go through it. So cancer services have remained unopened uh, and essentially unchanged. Um, we have always had a facility to refer people for what's called a two week wait outpatient appointment and that continued as normal, but um, we were encouraged to discuss cases um, with the hospital and that was made very easy using an electronic system. Um, however, there was a very definite drop in the numbers of people being referred by that um, usual route. And I think, I mean, public health, I'm sure you'll come on to it. We're expecting, therefore, to be um, an increased number of people with cancer who are presenting late and have um, adverse consequences. So elective care refers to outpatients. So um, and uh, it also refers to some of the surgery that is planned. Um, that essentially went on hold at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we were again encouraged as GPs to um, if we felt that somebody did need specialist care in hospital to use electronic or telephone methods to consult with uh, specialists before sending anyone in. Um, they would, as you can read, arrange some face to face appointments, but there was very much the expectation that we that as little as possible would be done during the early phase of the pandemic in hospital. Um, so GPs were being supported to manage a lot of it as well virtually. Um, people on waiting lists, uh, those a lot of those were reviewed um, and a number of those were um, alloc not allocated appointments basically during that time. Um, the people are going, they're going through those waiting lists now to try and um, kind of catch that up. Um, lots of people with existing appointments at the time that the pandemic started, so with, with a booked appointment, were called by the consultants and their teams. Um, so they had telephone consultations, some virtual consultations as well, but on the main it was telephone consultations. Um, there was some use of the independent sector to do surgery. So there was sort of, I suppose, an expectation that some sites that were not attached to general hospitals where you know there were coronavirus cases being admitted was safe to do some um, activity and that was mainly again I think some of the urgent cases surgery. Um, next slide. It's called urgent care I think. Where's that? Oh, oh, oh there we go. So urgent care is um, what's available basically by phoning 999 or 111 um, and also the uh, front doors of hospitals, so accident and emergencies and urgent care centres. So all of those have remained open. Um, attendances to hospital sites did significantly reduce earlier on in the pandemic, but have been increasing gradually. Um, 
111 became at the beginning of the, the port of call for all COVID related symptoms and they were I think quite significantly overwhelmed for, for a, 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 at least two to three weeks um, until a lot of other services were launched, particularly in GP surgeries, to attend to the COVID demand. Um, so I was aware of quite a lot of wait, long waits for people calling with any issue, including whether COVID or non-COVID related. And there's been quite a lot of learning throughout um, the use of 111 during the pen pandemic, which has led to this new campaign called Help Us Help You. So the idea is is because we don't we we recognise that there's a there has been and there could be again a significant risk attending a hospital and mixing with people. The idea is that we really promote um, that people call ahead, so they speak to one 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 before attending, and and have um, you know decisions made about the best place for them to present to, including primary care. And as a result, primary care also opened up some directly bookable appointments. From 111. Um, next slide. Yeah, so just because obviously there's a now a real emphasis on infection. Oh, hang on, this is a different slide to my. <laughs> the beginning is a different slide to the one I've got. So um, yeah, nationally GP appointments moved to 100% triage model. So what that meant is similarly to the hospitals is that we would avoid seeing anybody. Um, Avoid. We we all had our our doors closed. We would avoid seeing seeing anyone unless they were invited after a phone call um, or video. And I think that was actually a very effective um, way of consulting for the for a large number of people throughout the early part of the pandemic. There's clearly people who would struggle um, to make contact through phone or video, um, either for sort of unawareness of the process or, or you know not online or not enough credit or, or not English as their first language. So um, surgeries did have to sometimes deal with people coming to the door. A lot of them were directed to still telephone um, or use 111. Um, there's been quite a lot of interest in how much GP services adapted and changed with updated um, guidance to us as to how to continue including how to, you know, a lot of the digital solutions were quite impressive that we were, we were offered as well. Um, then for GP surgeries, but also hospital infection control remains really important. So um, people are always contacted now um, before any visit to um, ask them for their symptoms. So obviously if there's temperature or cough, they are asked not to present, but also that um, to explain what the, the, ho the hospitals are doing in terms of wearing masks and, and things like that, queuing and waiting room use. Um, and there's quite a lot of material out there to, to give people advice through the hospital sites or Public Health England. I think that's all for those slides. Thank you, Julie. And I'm happy to answer questions. I don't know whether the Public Health presentation tags onto this and you want to wait or... Hi, um, Maria, you wanted to ask a question? Councillor Hall? Maria? Yeah, it's not exactly a question, but much more uh, something to let you know that you were just saying that <clears throat> 111 was the first protocol for people that they had coronavirus. But I happened to call 111 because, again, they were non English speaking people. And there was just absolutely no help at all and whatsoever. They were left, on one occasion, they were left a week without a response. They said they were going to telephone back and they were going to get in touch to see what they were going to do. That person was left to their own device. They never were contacted. They never called them back. Nothing. And also, whenever somebody with a speaking Spanish language, for example, that was the case of the, my contacts of the Latin Americans, uh, they never, ever, ever spoke or made any intent of transfer. I know that they were overwhelmed, but that is my experience that perhaps you want to add to the to the, to the report, because yeah. the um, the people with other languages, they were not, not helped at all. I understand that at one stage, somebody speaking French was helped, but Spanish, no. That was it, it was my comment. Thank you. Maybe I think that's something that we need to scope in and 
when we're dealing with all the partners to say that let's look think about community languages as well because different parts of the borough's got different needs isn't language needs so, so i mean with, they, i i would i would attribute that to purely the the extent of the pressure on the system at the time because all 111 and gp services hospital services have access to telephone interpreters and Certainly, from a GP point of view, it, we've we've not had any difficulty obtaining interpreters. I think there was early part of the pandemic that 111 service was genuinely overwhelmed. They recruited, you know, hundreds of new staff to take on the calls. There were there were you know overnight changes in some of the ways that GPs and and hospitals were operating to cope with the pandemic. So I think there will be some people who didn't get a good enough service at the time. Um, what was important was that um, there's always been an ability to obviously to make complaints and record incidents, but, but, but what was also suspended as part of the pandemic was the obligation for organisations to um, present their quality data back and to commissioners. So that's something that we've been really um, that's taken very seriously at the CCG is that we're aware there may not have been opportunities for us to learn the extent of, of problems in that at that early stage of the pandemic. We're certainly making sure that systems are in place now. If we get a second wave, that 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 you know, there's there's not a sort of well, there was a crisis, and I think I think a lot of things had had to be prioritised. But we're really hoping that ne this next time round, if there is a next time, we're in a much better position to um, to respond. We're doing a lot of planning around that. Okay. May I just say something else? Yeah, okay, quickly. Actually, mm -hmm. the, the whole thing changed towards uh, May, so the situation was really bad at the end of March, April, and the first two weeks in May. But I, I noticed that as May progressed, the situation was getting better. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, next question, David Noakes. David, oh. just coming on. Yeah. Sure. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wondered, in in regards to the sort of understanding of of the offer and and, and what people are meant to do, I just wondered, Nancy, your comment. I mean, do do people are people turning up at GP surgeries and then sort of having to be quickly turned away, or and and the same at A and E? I mean, do do you think people understand the processes and? I mean, the figures are still obviously quite well. I see there's a 45 percent reduction in the cancer services, and sort of got to about half the sort of level that we had at A and E from the previous year. So there's still quite a lot of people seem to be staying away, and I just wondered your thoughts on on how well it's working and, and what more needs to be done in a sense to get people engaging with health services again. Um. So I'm aware that there was um, a campaign probably in the middle of May to to remind people that the NHS was open because you're absolutely right that there was a huge reduction in the number of people attending. I've forgotten the name of the campaign. I don't know if public health colleagues can remember, but there was very definitely a um, that was in the news. I don't know if you remember that the, there was much, uh, um, there was a, there was an early recognition that people weren't going and that they wanted to say we are still open. Um, GP surgeries now are, are, as far as I know, all open. So there were a number that closed because they were providing COVID only services uh, and they didn't have this. They also, there were a number that, that closed because they had to centralise staff because there were a lot of people off sick or shielding. So there were a lot of staff issues affecting whether surgeries could open and the infection control was so important as well that, 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 um, that you know, there was definitely a period of time where, where things were were closed. Um, I, th I think what I would mention is that Health Watch have done a report about access um, and those who did phone their GP to seek help had a very positive experience. So I think that whatever the mitigations we put in place did suit an awful lot of people. I think there is probably an unknown number of people who would have wanted help who couldn't get it because they didn't know or they didn't you know, they, they tried, tried to present and, and the, it, it looked closed. Certainly lots of patients said to me, I thought you were closed. But I think the numbers are certainly picking up now. And, and, and I'd be surprised if there are people who now don't know that it's possible to seek help. There's certainly a large number of people who don't want 
even now to come into a GP surgery and certainly higher number who don't want to go into hospital. So even if they are being offered face to face appointments now or they're coming to the point in the waiting list where they could have, have their surgical procedures, there are people who are refusing because they're too frightened about the cons possible consequences of, of catching coronavirus, which in a, I think in our part of London is actually quite a low risk at the moment. So I think it is important that they're given correct messages so they can make a decision and not, you know, not suffer the consequences of, a, of another health problem that might be neglected as a result or not. You know, not treated. Yeah. Charlie, yeah. Charlie, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, along with um, cancer patients who maybe were reluctant to go to hospitals, it was reported that people with heart conditions also failed to to turn up. Um, and I just wonder whether, because of that, the number of people who have died because of heart disease or heart attacks has gone up. Is there any way of knowing that um, those figures have risen at all? So I I think, can I do any of the public health team answer that? I, I, from what I know is, yes, there were there were people presenting late with more severe heart related problems. I don't know, Jin? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's almost quite, it's almost too soon. Um, but we, we do have some very early um, um, comments in the slides that we will share in a while okay. uh, but I'm not sure that it's tracking through into the actual data yet okay okay thank you Charlie did, did you want to is that okay okay thank you Jane and in terms of um going ahead would it be easier I suppose for me to change it around in um, public health, Jen, were you going to do the, the COVID-19 scrutiny report? Were you going to? My my colleagues, Chris and Sylvia, are presenting. They've done a lot of work on this JSNA, um, yeah. and obviously I'll join them for the Q&A. Right, OK, because because I was just wondering whether maybe as chairs, wondering maybe it, it, follow on from what Nancy said, we're talking about public health and whatever, it'd be easier to take, I think it's agenda point, is it seven COVID impacts on the NHS, get the public health to do your presentation now, is that okay? Yeah. Um, that just all. follows on of from course. that, because I yeah. think that's an, that's a natural progression. So if yeah. you want to go ahead with that, Chris? Yeah, no problem. Just share yeah. my screen now. You see this? That's if people don't mind, because I just thought it's just a natural progression just to do that as well. Is my screen visible? Yes, we, yes, it yeah, is. We can see it. Um, so okay, everyone should have it in their in their notes as well. Supplementary agenda. Okay. We were, our plan today was to cover a, a couple of aspects based on your feedback. Right. Yeah. Because we want about inequalities. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to touch through some of the the latest data in terms of trends and inequalities, and then my colleague Sylvia is going to touch on some of the health, social and economic impacts in the medium and longer term as well. Okay. I think it's worth just pointing out at this point that our kind of intelligence and evidence is kind of constantly changing and evolving. Um, and this is kind of where we're at at the minute, but we, we're constantly kind of keeping it up to date and reviewing. Um, so to start with cases, uh, as at the end of June, uh, in Southwark we'd had 1,434 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the borough. Um, and that pattern of infection broadly mirrors our, our neighbouring boroughs. So charts, uh, figure one on the left hand side uh, shows the daily number of cases in Southwark since the beginning of the year in, in kind of pink bars and the blue line showing the seven day average. And you can see from that that we saw a, quite a peak at the end of um, April, uh, sorry, end of March, early April, um, and that mirrors the kind of national pattern as well. And we've tailed off quite significantly since then. Um, as of uh, a couple of days ago, we'd had seven confirmed cases within the last week. So our number of cases on a daily basis at this point is relatively low, and that kind of mirrors our neighbouring boroughs. Okay. The, the chart on the right just shows the um, what we'd call the epidemic curve. So tracking from our first cases through to the present day and the extent to which the trajectory of different boroughs was different. 
and you can see Southwark shown in the pink line there. And again, we're kind of broadly comparable with uh, neighbouring Lambeth in the light blue. In terms of mortality, um, we use data from the Office of National Statistics. And as of the 26th of June, we'd had 248 COVID related deaths in Southwark. And this is all people who live in the borough and includes both hospital and non-hospital deaths. Um, and the chart there just shows that our number of uh, deaths, uh, our level of deaths is broadly comparable to our neighbouring boroughs again. Um, so the, the number of deaths is shown in the bar and the rate of deaths is shown as the dot. And we're, we're broadly in line with what we'd seen at Lambeth and Greenwich. One of the things we can do using the ONS data is to break down by place of deaths. So um, the, the table here kind of breaks down by location for both Southwark, our kind of southeast London region, and nationally as well. And up to the end of June, um, around two thirds of COVID related deaths in the borough had occurred within a hospital setting. And that kind of mirrors the national and regional pattern. And around a quarter of deaths within the borough had occurred within a care home. And again, that mirrors the national pattern. So up to the 26th of June among Southwark residents, 59 of those COVID related deaths had taken place in their care home. 20 had occurred within their own home, but the vast majority occurring in a hospital setting. One of the things we've been looking at as well, uh, based on feedback from the chief medical officer, is this concept of excess deaths. So rather than just looking at COVID related, looking at whether our number of deaths over a given period is greater than what we would normally expect. And the idea is that this might give a greater understanding of the totality of the burden of the epidemic on the population. So the chart on the left, figure four, breaks down on a weekly basis our um, excess deaths. Where the bars are blue and below the line, that shows the level of death within that week is below what we would normally expect. And where it's pink, it's higher than what we would normally expect. And you can kind of see that uptick from around week 12 kind of mid-March through to early May, where our levels of excess deaths in Southwark exceeded what we would normally um, consider uh, usual at this point in the year. And then kind of moving through to the uh, June period, so from week 22 onwards, our levels of excess deaths are actually below what we would normally expect at this time of year. Breaking that down into different causes, um, the chart on the right looks at number of deaths on a weekly basis by COVID and non-COVID related conditions. And you can kind of see um, that uptick uh, in, in mortality is generally being associated with COVID related deaths in Southwark. But we know on a national basis, there is some suggestion that excess deaths is, are not wholly accountable by COVID-19, um, suggesting that other causes may be affected, which I think picks up um, one of the earlier comments. But at, at a local level, it, it's a bit too early to say, given the information we've got. In terms of inequalities, we know prior to COVID-19 within Southwark, we had a range of health, social and economic um, inequalities within the borough. And these two maps, just kind of a high level illustration of that, showing male and female life expectancy in, in the borough by um, ward. And kind of for both uh, sexes, a significant inequality and gap in life expectancy in a relatively short distance um, for both sexes. And I know um, from your comments from your previous meeting, there are a range of groups you were particularly interested in, in terms of the impact of COVID-19. I think one thing I would like to say at this point is that our local intelligence in terms of inequalities is highly variable and a bit limited due to the way that testing and cases were recorded um, by the national programme. Um, but we know from a lot of the work that's been done by Public Health England and the Office of National Statistics uh, that a number of groups have been shown to be greatly affected. Um, and this chart, this slide just summarises some of those and I'll go into them in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, but just quickly, we know that age is the largest driver of disparity in terms of COVID related deaths um, and also sex men more than twice as likely to uh, die from COVID-19 as their female counterparts. From an ethnicity point of view, there's significant, significant variation between different ethnic minority groups, particularly for those from black and Asian backgrounds. And also health has been a, a, a large driver in terms of mortality from COVID-19 um, and the majority of those dying from the condition having other underlying long-term health conditions. 
Both deprivation and geography are a key factor, and we know that mortality is highest in our most deprived communities and urban settings, which is a kind of a double whammy for parts of the borough. Mm -hmm. um, and certain public facing roles for an occupation perspective um, have greater risks of exposure and mortality too. And then just going on to um, care home settings, we know that mortality on a national basis is um, much higher in care homes than we would normally expect given this point in the year and a number of other groups have been affected too. But just to go through those in a bit more depth, um, in terms of age and sex, we know that, um, like I say, age has been the largest driver of disparity in terms of COVID outcomes and around um, two thirds of COVID related deaths have occurred amongst those who are aged over 80. Um, and you can see from the chart there, um, it shows the mortality rate by age group and sex, dark blue bars showing males and light blue bars showing females. And you can see that quick uptick in mortality from the age of around 70 um, and mortality rates amongst men exceeding those of females in all age groups. In terms of ethnicity, um, ONS did some quite detailed analysis looking at this earlier in the year. Um, and what they did was to try and account for a range of social and economic factors to see whether they could explain higher rates of mortality. So their analysis took account of age deprivation, um, housing composition, education and other factors um, as a way to try and explain that. But even when they factored all those um, variables into account, they still found higher rates of mortality among certain ethnic groups. And that's shown in this chart here, um, which breaks down the risk of dying from COVID related deaths by ethnicity and sex compared to the white population. So the line across the middle, the pink line, that's um, that's for the white population and where the blue bars exceed that line, it shows a higher risk of mortality. And you can see for both black and Bangladeshi and Pakistani minority groups, they have a significantly higher risk of COVID related death compared to the white population, um, almost twice as high amongst um, uh, in some cases. As part of the way that PHE did in their national review, they did a, um, a kind of public engagement exercise and that highlighted a, a range of other themes as part of their, their work as well, um, which I don't think some of this will come to any surprise. Um, but the fact that COVID-19 is, is exacerbating underlying health conditions that are particularly affecting minority groups and also the fact that uh, min minority groups are often more exposed to COVID-19 due to the occupations that many people have. Um, moving on to healthcare and prevention, um, the fact that physical and mental health problems raise the risk of COVID-19 and they're particularly associated, associated with certain ethnic minority groups as well. And that for some population groups and communities, they're less likely to seek um, health support due to the fear of uh, discrimination and stigma as well which can delay their diagnosis and lead to poorer outcomes further down the line. When looking at other health factors, um, again, this is one of the key risk factors and it was identified earlier on, early on in the epidemic. Um, we know that those with underlying health conditions um, are particularly at risk and around 90% um, of COVID related deaths that have had an underlying health condition with most of those having at least two and the table there just shows um, uh, different health conditions and the change in mortality um, between those what we would normally expect and in the current situation and COVID related deaths much more likely to include reference to conditions such as diabetes and hypertension than non-COVID related deaths. And again just picking up uh, a factor there around obesity. There's been several studies which indicate a much increased risk of diverse outcomes for those who are um, obese or morbidly obese. Just touching on to deprivation and geography, as I mentioned, um, similar to a lot of health outcomes, we know that these play a great um, influence in terms of inequalities and in outcomes um, and uh, much higher levels of COVID related deaths are seen in our more deprived communities. Um, and similarly, uh, urban settings are seen to have much higher levels of exposure, transmission and death as well. In terms of occupation, um, again, this received a lot of uh, attention um, earlier on in the pandemic, um, but a lot of the analysis is now indicating that those in public facing roles are found to be at 
found to have higher rates of COVID related mortality. Um, an analysis by the Office of National Statistics identified a couple of roles, um, particularly transport workers, security guards, and some care workers. I think it's worth pointing out at this point that kind of occupational risk is particularly complex um, because the way information is recorded and coded um, and the groups that they that's that are used in a lot of this analysis are quite broad, which makes it difficult to unpick what is the driving factor behind the the high levels of mortality. So the, there's a kind of note of caution in some of this, these statistics. But we can see that those three groups shown in, in this table are those that are sh shown to have a particularly higher risk of mortality. And finally, just to wrap up my section before I move on to Sylvia. Um, in terms of care homes, nationally, we know that they've been particularly badly affected and there's been over 14,000 COVID-related deaths within English care homes up to the end of June. And again, this chart just shows the, the trend in the pandemic and COVID-related deaths in both hospitals and care home settings um, over time on a national basis. And you can see that deaths within a hospital setting upticked much earlier on than they did in care homes. But as the pandemic progressed, they, the gap between the two has narrowed quite significantly. So they're kind of on par. And national ana analysis indicates there have been over 20,000 excess deaths in care homes compared to what we would normally expect given the, this period of the year. I think at this point I will hand over to my colleague Sylvia. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Victoria. No, no, no. So thank you, Chris. Um, Sylvia? Thanks very much. And so I'm just going to take you through a few slides uh, to outline some of the, well, as Chris has been outlined, the, the impact that we know at the national level of, of COVID on the population and what we've been seeing, what we've been thinking about um, in the public health department. So what do we know about the, the our residents, about our local population? Actually, we're still pulling together data and currently what we have is, we, what we're going to present to you um, um, on this slide is we're halfway through um, doing uh, a very short survey with our local residents and we have almost one and a half thousand responses. Now, what this, these are very early findings show that all aspects of life as would be expected have been impacted. And this is, of course, not only by COVID, but also by the lockdowns, the measures put in place to try and minimise the spread of COVID through the population. And, and what you can see by looking um, at, the, at the graph at the bottom is that the largest effect has been on, on people's social activities. So three quarters of, res of respondents found that their social lives, which is absolutely um, essential to their well-being, had a huge effect. But all areas were affected, mental health, physical fitness, um, finances, workload, employment. Actually, overall, finances, workload and employment possibly had a, were, were actually classified as slightly less important. Next slide, please. So in terms of the impacts on health, we've tried to frame it, or in terms of the impacts on the population, we tried to frame it in um, using an approach where we divide it into health impacts, social impacts and economic impacts. Of course, there is a huge overlap um, because your physical health, for example, will impact your mental health. Your economic well-being will impact your, your health as well. Um, so everything is interlinked. So this is just one way that we try to categorise it. And we're not saying that these lists are, are exclusive and, and, and don't interlink. But what is really clear, what has been coming out of, of um, speaking to not only um, the, the local population, but also from the service providers, is that... Um, the impacts are felt disproportionately amongst the most vulnerable populations and COVID and the mitigation factors to reduce the spread of COVID is widening inequalities. So in terms of health impacts, with, we're looking at and thinking about chronic and long-term health impacts, acute health care. We're talking also about delivery of health care, such as immunisations, which has already been touched upon, um, and, and screening services. Um, children, young people, hugely affected in sexual health. Now, social impacts again are quite broad and, and interlinked and, and include mental health well-being or the safeguarding i'm going to go into these in a bit more in the next slides and economic impacts um the wider determinants of health around housing and food security job security job losses and, and education next slide please chris so focusing in on the health impacts well thinking about chronic health conditions 
there is a lot of evidence in the literature that um, economic impacts are likely to lead to increased chronic conditions. Now, we're likely to not see those impacts yet, but likely to see that in the coming months to years. So the timeline for this is more into the future. This, these are going to be the repercussions in the longer term. Acutely, as Chris has covered, we know that people who suffer from, from chronic conditions, for example, hypertension, respiratory conditions, are at a high risk of, of death if they do get COVID. Um, we also know that there has been a reduction in GP appointments, but that's already been discussed, and that has been offset slightly by, by online appointments, by telephone appointments. At the national level, there's been, um, there have been reports of reduced people attending A&E, um, where actually, for example, in April, uh, A&E attendance dropped by 60% compared to the previous year. Cancer screening has been paused, school immunisations has been paused, and we know that um, uh, but the, I mean, sorry, school immunisation be paused, but other essential immunisations have continued. However, there's been some anecdotal evidence of people reporting that they don't want to take their children to be immunised. So there's a concern there about vaccine preventable diseases. Next slide, please. So in terms of the social impact, so to touch on mental health, so before COVID, we know that one and a half thousand children and young people and 23,000 adults in Southwark were likely to have depression or anxiety. And the and COVID is likely to have impacted this in, in many different ways um, for, for those who are, for example, shielding, um, especially who, who have been reporting loneliness. But it's not just the shielded population. It's many people who, who haven't been socialising as much or, or have been cut off from their usual networks. Um, there are also concerns about healthcare workers and frontline workers who've been dealing with a lot of very, who've been dealing with, with huge workloads, um, but also high numbers of, of death and concerns about PTSD in that population. Um, in terms of safeguarding, lockdown has, has um, made it more challenging to, to protect p potentially very vulnerable families um, and, and has potentially increased the risk of, of vulnerable families um, being exposed to domestic violence in in the in, in their homes. In terms of risk factors, the messages around this have been a little bit mixed, and some people have reported eating more healthily. Um, others have reported um, that the 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 levels of food insecurity have risen hugely, and we know that people have um, have had big challenges due to economic, but also due to shielding in accessing food. And it's probably the most vulnerable communities that have been most affected that again is likely or potentially will increase as we feel the economic impacts over the next few months. Uh, and in terms of the other um, behaviours, for example, alcohol, we know alcohol sales have risen, um, potentially other risk-taking behaviours, um, risk-taking sexual behaviours. Um, there may be long-term repercussions of this. Next slide, please. Thanks, Chris. So next one, we focus in on the economic impacts. So in terms of housing, there are in this in this slide, you'll see there are, there's a combination of, for example, increasing the actual risk of getting COVID. So people who live in houses of multiple occupancy, where many people are living under one roof, are at increased risk of transmitting COVID to other people because they live very closely to them. They share bathrooms, they share living spaces. And, we, and there are 5,000 um, houses of multiple occupancy houses of multiple occupancy. Especially concerning would be multi-generational households where we have much more vulnerable older residents living with, with younger people. Um, there are concerns about increased homelessness and, and falling into debt and, and losing a roof over their head. We've talked about food insecurity as well. Um, the issue now that we're thinking about with food insecurity isn't just accessing food but also accessing healthy food and trying to make sure that people are healthy into the long term. In terms of economic instability, well, in, in Southwark itself there have been almost 40,000 furloughed jobs, um, but there's been na uh, nationally a quarter of businesses have, have closed. And again, these, these impacts are felt disproportionately. So low earners are far more likely than high earners to work in the sector. So the hospitality sectors that have shut down. So these impacts aren't going to be felt evenly. Next slide, please. Just to summarise. So we know that COVID-19, and when I say COVID-19, as I said, it's not just the illness itself, but also the mitigating factors to try and prevent spread. It's had a significant impact 
but we're likely to feel this for quite a long time for the months and years to come. And actually the impact that we're seeing is around increasing inequality. Um, at the national level, we know that acutely older people, men, those with underlying health conditions and, and certain ethnic minorities, and those in public facing roles are more likely to either get COVID or have severe disease if they do get COVID. But now what we are thinking about is the, is the more long term, medium to long term impacts of the repercussions that the way that COVID and, and the mitigating factors have, have affected um, the wider determinants of health. Thanks, Chris. Thank, thanks, Sylvia. I've just I've just got a couple of questions before I go to the rest of the members. Um, yep. Have you got a breakdown in terms of because you said it's 1,383 responses. Have you got a breakdown in terms of age, gender and ethnicity? so we can see whether it's representative because obviously for Southwark you know and then then also you said that this is just um the beginning are you going to do a second part go back to those respondents in a few weeks time or are you going to expand the responses because you said so, you've only just started yes so in terms of the, the the short survey that's being done um this was run by uh, the community engagement team um and okay. we the survey closed uh, only i think last week um, so we've literally just got the data. So that was a kind of um, a quick first headline um, okay. for yourselves. But we'd, we're certainly look to uh, dig into those findings and look at inequalities and how those vary between different groups as well. Um, okay. We're also um, working with Comres to do a more in-depth and representative survey across the borough on a range of health, social and economic factors and how COVID's impacted those uh, within our communities too. And we're hoping to get that work done um, and, and completed by the autumn. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions? Maria? Maria, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you for the presentation, very thorough. Um, I think that uh, the, the, there are two things, if I may uh, chair, that I would like to ask. One thing is, have you had, it will start from by the end of the presentation, um, an analysis, a deep analysis of the uh, mental health impact on people suffering domestic violence, and especially children that have been in households of domestic violence people or couples? And the second question is, have you done, I know that you have done a depth analysis of the debt amount in the in the barrel, but have you done about an analysis of the people that were actually contaminated with COVID, but they never went to hospital, they just stayed at home, but they were diagnosed as positive for COVID? Those were my two questions. Thank you. Did you want to? Do you want to take another question because I'm um, from Councillor Dennis who's joined us and then you can answer them all in, in a group. Helen? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, one, just a, a kind of obvious data follow up, which is whether or not we have access or will have access down the line to the ONS data, but disaggregated at a Southwark level. Um, so that we can kind of see the uh, the analysis at a kind of more granular level. Um, and I guess a question about how the analysis that you've been doing, um, and particularly the work coming out of the survey, is going to be used internally. Um, I was wondering whether or not it's specifically feeding into any preparatory work around potential further um, second wave or um, how it might uh, how we might respond if there was a local lockdown and, and whether or not the survey work, for example, and is feeding in or is it um, how else is that analysis going to be used internally and, and shared amongst other relevant, well, all all departments really across the council? Thank you. If Chris and Sylvia, if you can answer those questions and then I'll come back to David Noakes. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, Sylvia, are you going to go? Um, so, um, in terms of uh, the the data and, and positive cases, um, while we do get um, quite a lot of information now and um, from PHE, um, the NHS and different other government bodies, um, it's often quite fragmented uh, and limited in terms of the quality of some of this information. 
So while we get um, line data on positive cases, the demographic information we get on those people is quite limited. Um, so we do get age and um, a postcode, but we do not get currently um, good quality information on things like ethnicity or occupation or anything like that, unfortunately. Um, and that reflects, I think, the way the, the program was set up right back at the beginning of the pandemic. They simply weren't collecting some of this information. Um, so they're kind of playing catch up in some of this. But certainly as that goes forward and um, those processes become more robust, we'll certainly be trying to look at some of that at a local level. Um, in terms of the ONS data, um, we there's a, there's a time lag in terms of our mortality data. We do get really detailed information on this, um, but the time lag on it is normally a couple of months, which kind of limits um, how effective it is in terms of our planning for some of this stuff. Um, but we're certainly looking to analyse more detail of our um, COVID-related deaths and other deaths, to see whether it's affected other conditions um, as that data allows. So we are planning to do that work. And finally, just to pick on the, on the survey data, um, a lot of this will be feeding into our recovery plans, both within the council and uh, with the NHS partners as well as part of Partnership Southwark. So we're definitely feeding some of this information, both uh, the information we've gone through today, but the additional analysis we're looking to do, um, both from community surveys and engagement and also um, some of the more statistical work we're planning, that will definitely be going into the recovery plans and preparations for um, winter and any potential second wave. Can, can I sort of just add, Chair, um, so, so that so the um, information and the data is feeding into, as Chris said, into the recovery planning, into winter planning, and then into some of the ongoing service reviews. So at the moment, there's a review for, on the community hub and how we can improve the sort of provision and preparation for um, the autumn stroke winter and any potential second wave. Um, we're obviously also at the moment in the council and also in the public health team uh, um, renewing and reviving a lot of our ongoing services. So it's informing the way that we are redesigning things like our health checks, the accessibility of a lot of our other services like sexual health services, um, improving the digitalization of our services. And of course, I don't know whether perhaps Sylvia might want to say something about the health inequalities strategy that we will want to develop um, on behalf of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Shall I, shall I just um, quickly give another, uh, an overview Chair of yeah, the Health and Quality Fund. Yeah, <laughs> um, so what's become really clear in this work is that COVID has very much widened inequalities. And so what we're setting out at the moment is how can we better tackle this? What do we need to do to try and reduce those inequalities? So right at this moment, as well as um, doing the engagement work that, that Chris has mentioned, some other engagement work is we're looking at, um, at, at how what do we want our approach to be and we're developing that strategy now so we're, we're sort of thinking about that over the next few weeks or so um to be brief on it thank you um they they can i have an answer to my questions please so, chair i asked two questions and nobody has answered so sorry. you ping that one sylvia question, sorry do you want to just repeat your question again, please, Maria? Because I think well, your questions came before, I think, Helen's. Well, wasn't I it? asked the first questions before Helen, and then you asked Helen, and the questions of Helen were answered, but not mine. So the questions that I asked was, first of all, apart from doing the in-depth analysis that you have done for mortality, have you also done or think about doing an analysis for people who actually was contaminated with yes. COVID, but they didn't? possibly go to hospital, but they were tested positive. Did you do that? So that was the first question. The second question is, have you done a research, an in-depth research analysis of the people who are domestic violence sufferers and the impact on mental health on those people, and particularly on the children that uh, were from households of domestic violence? Those were the two questions. Yeah. Uh, Thank uh, you, Maria. 
Apologies, um, Maria. Um, I think with the ongoing surveys that we're doing through the Council's consultation hub, and as Chris mentioned, there'll be some more in-depth surveys through Comres and Social Life, there will be questions around mental health and well-being that we will be picking up on, and that will inform some of the work that we're doing around the reviewing of our loneliness strategy, our um, suicide prevention strategy. Unfortunately, um, I think it's quite difficult to capture some of the information on domestic violence, but where that's, that's uh, reported back through the surveys, we will certainly be including that in the the analysis. I think what's more useful also is that there are some in-depth in literature surveys um, on the impact on domestic violence of the pandemic and over the COVID period. Some of that's been published and I would have thought that in terms of the population in Southwark, um, some of the national studies will certainly be reflected in the local experience and we would want to triangulate and draw some of that into our local discussions when we start uh, looking at the more detailed surveys. Your, your other point about the um, confirmed cases, I think where the cases are confirmed by local laboratory, then they're actually fed into Chris's analysis. So we get all that data as best as we can, and we've reported on that. As Chris said, with the confirmed cases, this is previously, unfortunately, in terms of the recording of it, they don't report back on ethnicity, for example. But I, my understanding is that going forward, we will have the ethnicity data that is being collected. This is on the confirmed laboratory cases. Unfortunately, I think part of a, the problem problem that we've had all along also as um, because the symptoms are you know you'll have cases that are asymptomatic that we wouldn't know about there are cases that are symptomatic and actually the difficulty is encouraging people to to send off for the test so that we actually know that they're a confirmed case and so I sus we suspect that obviously there are cases out there that we don't know about. So the message there is that, of course, you know, get yourself tested if you're symptomatic, that the testing now is pretty easy to access online and then it can be recorded and then we'll be able to do the follow up. But thank you for the question and, and apologies for not answering it. So thank you very much for the answer. Uh, Maria, Maria, can I just, um, in yeah. response to your second question about um, impacts and mental health and well-being of ch on on children, we're going to be taking that up in the work plan. It, hopefully, in the next meeting, because we need a September meeting to deal about the mental I, health I issues. Saw that. I, saw I think that. if you see that, and that's where we're going to pick it up because we spent so long on the care homes and whatever, we're going to pick that up in the next meeting, but do that in more detail, so it hasn't been forgotten. Thank you very much. Because I know that's been a concern from day one. Can we just pick up um, questions from David before we uh, try and break for a comfort break, please? David Noakes. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, and thank you for the presentation uh, from Chris and Sylvia. Uh, I just got a couple of questions. One is um, what you didn't say, and I don't know if it's because it's not available at a borough level, um, but do you know what the current R rate is in Southwark? Um, and is there any sign that you're aware of if there is a borough R rate um, of it increasing as we've started to ease the lockdown. And um, my second question is, um, can you say anything about what testing facilities exist in the borough? My, only, my understanding is that uh, you can only go and get tested if you've got a car. And I just wonder if there's any walk-in facilities for testing and also what's the um, responsibility of the borough's public health team in regard to test and trace, is that do we have, are we doing testing and tracing in Southwark or is that coordinated at a regional level? Thank you. Um, I'm happy to, to kick off the um, answers on that and Chris and Sylvia, please do come in. So in terms of the um, testing, um, clearly there's the online testing. So we would actually support and advise that if you are symptomatic to go online, the turnaround generally is pretty fast. You should be getting the test through the post um, within 24 hours, we're told, and the actual turnaround is about 48 to 72 hours and it's improving uh, all the time because clearly we wouldn't encourage people who are symptomatic 
to go out. Now, having said that, you can, um, th there is the drive through centre, as you know, in O2, and then there's also a um, drive in or indeed walk to centre in Bel Air Park um, in Dulwich area. We are investigating, looking at whether or not we can position that particular testing facility, the test, the Southwark facility in more central parts of the borough, but there are particular requirements. So for example, car parking and queuing and traffic issues, but we do want to make that facility a little bit more accessible. There's some potential to arrange for a, when we um, we, we call that the, the facility in Bel Air almost like a drive through. It's almost like a little tent. Um, there are smaller vehicles that can be arranged for and we're investigating whether or not it might be possible to have a more flexible um, arrangement by using the smaller vehicles. Um, you had another question on the R rate. Now, the R rate, um, I see Chris is frozen. <laughs> the R rate is for London, as I understand it. Uh, there's no R rate at a borough level, and that's because of all the methodological issues. However, what we do do is that we do monitor the data really, really, really carefully. And um, I think probably you would have heard on the news there were issues around, oh yes, do we get a pillar two data? So, pil so pillar one is the data that's is the tests that are done in the hospital setting. Pillar two are your community tests. Commu the, the community tests by that is your postal tests and also the walk-ins. And yes, we do get all of that that data and by monitoring that data, I think Chris said that we had something like seven, is it seven cases in the last seven yes. days? Yes, yeah, so the, it is pretty It is pretty low. And just to give you a, an idea, um, when we talk about the cases, actually, um, it's not always that indicative. It's almost quite more useful to look at the rates. And if you look at the Southwark rates, it's about, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about about three or 3.5 for Southwark, it's, it's around that. And if you look at London, it's about, it's, it's very, it's reflective of London, which is about 3.7 per 100,000. And if you look at England, it's about seven. So the rest of England is high. And as you probably know, that's that's influenced by what's happening in the, around Leicester and in the Northwest, um, the, the, the North of England. And just to give you an idea of the sort of magnitude as well. So, are we or are we not sort of, you know, concerned at the moment, things are actually okay-ish in London. Things can change really, really quickly. But in in in, in Suffolk, it's about 3.5, as I've said, and you probably have heard about Blackburn and Derwent. And just to do a quick comparison, um, it's about 115 per 100,000. So there's a huge magnitude of, of, um, dif of difference. Um, between us and, um, sorry, it's about 47 for Blackburn and Derwent, and I think it's about 115 for Leicester. So there's a big magnitude of difference. Yeah, just well, to follow up on the R rates, um, uh, like Jin said, it's done at a regional level by the government just to, just to the methodological issues in terms of calculating. It's released every Friday. The latest figures for London, uh, the R rate was between 0.7 and 1. Um, compared to 0.7 to 9 for the country as a whole. I think the issue to just flag with the R rate is it becomes a bit um, problematic when cases become low in terms of how accurate it is in terms of measuring change. Um, so I think using the R rate in combination with the number of cases is, is the best way forward. Okay. Can I just ask one very quick follow on, Chair? Very quick, and then I'll go to Charlie, and then we'll go for a comfort break. Go on, David. Yeah, health interest, I have to say, but um, I, I believe I had COVID nineteen in March, and I just wondered, do, do you have any intelligence on when the antibody tests are going to become available? The and the antibody tests are one, currently David. available for NHS and social care staff. Uh, there's been no announcement about um, antibody testing for the general public, although there are some pilots and academic studies that are being run. But um, I think the important message there about antibody testing is that just because you think you've had COVID and just because you may 
come back with a positive antibody test, really it shouldn't. It's the, the real purpose of the antibody testing is really just to understand as part of an academic study uh, how uh, the disease has been transmitted uh, previously and it shouldn't um, change anything about whether or not if you have become symptomatic to apply for a, another test because you can get reinfected and certainly if you're a, a um, healthcare worker you should be concerned about um, wearing your usual PPE and your infection prevention control it shouldn't change any of that. So, Sylvia, sorry. Sylvia, did you want to add a comment to what yeah, Jen said? Yeah, I did just wanted to add a small comment to that, which was exactly as Ginger said. And just to reiterate that some people, we, we don't know how long immunity lasts, if it is even immunity. So I think getting an antibody test, apart from telling you you've been historically exposed, um, a false, a, a negative doesn't mean you've not been exposed, because people who have been exposed don't always have antibodies, but also it does not mean that you're going to be immune. Um, and we and there is still so much um, this there there are a lot of studies out there at the moment trying to work out exactly the significance of an antibody test. So just to kind of flag that. OK, yeah. Charlie, quickly. Just very briefly, um, yeah. the um, the risk of contracting COVID, I imagine it sort of mirrors uh, the actual deaths, you know, through class through ethnicity, through working close together, that type of thing. My, my big worry is that we have a quite a large area of the population, elderly people who've been locked in, locked down, and um, they're been coming out now, as David said, you know, we're, they're coming out onto the streets, and I hope that, that they don't suddenly, all, all of a sudden, get contract, get contact them the virus and that will put the figures up. That's what my mm. worry is. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I think we absolutely share your concern, which is why the key message is obviously um, partly, you know, it has to work both ways that individuals do need to, um, if they if they are symptomatic, to self-isolate, stay in and apply and apply for a test and 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 have your symptoms confirmed whether or not it's, um, you are whether or not you have COVID. I, I think the other thing is obviously about the social distancing. I think part of the difficulty is that of course with more people coming out and with more pubs and bars opening up, it is it is difficult. But I think all of us all of us have a responsibility to um, adopt the social distancing measures. That that hasn't changed, particularly if you are an older person on a, a person with um, um, long-term conditions or if you are more vulnerable to be really aware of um, your circumstances as well. Um, at a public health, at a population level, we actually, we do um, look at where all the cases are. We are very, very conscious of clusters of cases. We will monitor that. At the moment, we're not seeing any. As Chris has said, the numbers are very small. And we are absolutely learning from elsewhere where there are outbreaks. So there are um, seminars, there are um, lessons learned from Leicester, there are emerging type things from Blackburn. There are certainly things around the workplaces. So you've You've mentioned some of the manufacturing and sort of meat processing and some of these sort of uh, factory workshoppy type settings. We've started um, identifying where some of those are and we're doing a lot of proactive messaging for those um, those uh, settings as well. Let me tell you this, a chap got on the bus this afternoon, he sat right behind me and when I said to him, you're not wearing a mask, he said, I don't have to. He says, the driver's not wearing one. Idiot. There you go. That's what you got to put up. That with, attitude, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Real can we? Shame. Can we take some? Um, I think there's final hand from Helen. Did you want to have, ask another question, or was that from before? Helen. No, it was one more, if I'm allowed. Okay. <laughs> um, which was also um, one of personal interest, I suppose. Um, I wondered what work um, was also going on to look at the impacts around um, perinatal, postnatal mental health. Um, 
just anecdotally, um, you know, because I've been on, well, I still am on maternity leave, really, but um, I, I was lucky enough, obviously, to give birth to my daughter before um, COVID and before the lockdown. But I know that it has been very tough on um, on people who've been giving birth um, during lockdown, um, not just on the kind of the physical side, but the the lack of, um, I suppose, physical support from health visitors, um, a lot of, it, of things which have gone online, and then also the social support that normally exists for, for new mums and um, new parents um, in the area, which obviously that infrastructure has not been there. Um, and, and just in terms of thinking, therefore, about the survey work, um, I was wondering whether or not, um, I mean, there will be other target groups, I'm sure, that you've identified as well. Um, but, but things that we would want to learn from um, and think through our response as a council in terms of the recovery plan, as you said. Thank you. Did, did anyone have a quick response to that or Jane, Sophia or Chris? I, I think it's certainly something that we would want to explore in terms of any of the um, data and um, responses to the questionnaires. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure that we've we've actually identified anything out of the earlier surveys, but we'll have another look to see whether or not there are any responses. The other thing that we're convening is, of course, the health roundtable, um, which will be, I think, is scheduled for. Um, I'm looking at you, Sylvia. I think it's towards it's the, the end fifth. of. It's the first week of. August. Well, yes. Yeah. I think and it might be that there might be some opportunities there uh, to explore some of these issues. OK, thank you. Just. So Sylvia muted, were you going to say something? Sorry, just it's the 5th of August. 5th of August, OK. And um, I think I would just reiterate that, yeah, we're absolutely aware women in the per women and families um, so new fathers as well in the perinatal period are huge risk at any time, actually, in terms of, of mental health, um, ill health. Um, and I think we're aware of that. And I think at the moment, actually, uh, there are many populations. And so hopefully what this um, some of this early data will tell us is, is, is who do we need to focus? Who do we need to target on right now? Um, but agreed, men mental health, ill health is is a huge concern right now. OK. Just to say thank you, um, Chris, Sylvia and Jen, for that presentation, because, I mean, that's really, really helpful for the Commission. Um, at this point, I make it 8.16. Um, I think if we break for a 10 minute break and come back at 8.25. So we have a 10 minute comfort break and we'll come back. OK, if you want, if you want to switch your um, videos off. Thank you. Your camera is off.
Hi, Nancy. I'm just checking if anybody is anybody else back. Literally. Yep, I'm back. David here. Hi, David. It's just I can't. I'm here as well. It's Helen. Sorry, my camera's off. I can put it back on. Okay. Great, Julie. Okay. Who else is here? Hi, for Charlie. I'm back as well. Great. Is Charlie um, Fitzroy you back? I'm here, Chair. Right, okay. It's just I can't see anyone. Um, okay, if we... Is Charlie back? Is Maria there? Because I can't see. She's not on. Her camera's not on. Maria? I think they are present at the meeting chair, but I don't think their mics and um, cameras are on. The camera's they are still on. present. They are okay. still present in the meeting. Okay, because I can't, because I can't, I can't see that their camera's not on. So if people can put their cameras on, please, so I know who's there. Hi. Okay, if we. Thank you. Okay, so if we if we come back to. Um, the agenda. Um, item item six was coronavirus act care care at easements. That's just for that's a legal briefing, and that's basically just to, just for notes. The care act, and if there's any uh, um, easements, etc. Um, and if we can go to item seven, South East London CCG merger paper. Um, Nancy, were you going to comment on this? Yeah, I can do. Thank yeah, thank you, Julie. Um, so there's just three slides to update what's been happening. Um, first thing to say is there is a planned joint overview and scrutiny committee I think for the six boroughs in October on this so that might be an opportunity to find out a bit more if people are interested um, but we have yeah the CCG uh, there's a kind of long lead in time I'm not sure if April 2018 is correct I wonder if it's April 19 but anyway we took uh, several months several le uh, phases bits of governance etc um, to merge and form one CCG to cover the South East London on 1st of April. So you can read the six boroughs that have done that. Um, it's part of our response to the long term plan, which talks about the development of integrated care systems, um, which have a, have a broader footprint, i.e. Um, ac across an area of London as large as the six boroughs. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, so we've, there's been a lot of work to decide what um, is done at South East London, London level and what's done at borough level. Um, essentially, it's to be really simple approach. It's the out of hospital care that has been delegated to borough level. So the in hospital care is still coordinated and contracted at the South East London level. Um, the local commissioning board, so the Southwark, Southwark has a Southwark borough based board, um, will take on the role um, of coordinating commissioning for health services out of hospital in the borough, but also to bring together um, local authority commissioners to do some of this, this together. Um, the final sentence there talks about representation. So myself, Rob Davidson, who's another GP, and Sam Hepplewhite are all members of the South East London CCG governing body. So we provide the connection in terms of governance and representation. But the staff that constitute the health borough team are also, they are CCG employees that are given uh, responsibilities at borough, borough level. And there's an awful lot of networked um, networked working, sorry that's not very elegant, um, i.e. various boroughs leading on certain pieces of work and sharing good practice and um, doing it once at South East London and then and then replicating um, by by sharing at other borough level, at other boroughs. Do you want to come to the next slide, Julie? 
And because of the pandemic, some of the normal um, governance structure sort of processes were suspended. So um, we would have normally gone ahead in April with, with the first um, sort of board meeting, but we had our first one last week on Thursday, virtually, um, as you can see, there was a, it was a public meeting and there was the opportunity to ask questions. So today, the South East London CCG governing body also met for its second board meeting. Um, and we're, we're beginning to stand up lots of our other regular meetings um, and, and have a, have a, yeah, a work, a work programme, which is a lot focused on some of the recovery um, issues that we, that you've, we've referred to already. So some of the planning that needs to, to take place to respond to the, the pandemic. I'll stop there, but happy to take questions. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I think as a chair, I think it'd be useful if you could send us as much information as possible with th those two meetings, um, especially you said the, the 9th of July and the 16th of July. And obviously, in terms of, I don't know if you could drill down, you know, if the general public, how many people did actually view the meetings, because I think it's, especially in this pandemic, it's quite difficult for the general public. Obviously, they, they can't do face-to-face -face meetings, but also with the digital inclusion, exclusion, how many of the general public's affected who are actually in those meetings listening in and if yeah. if it's been put on a public platform later on for people to watch because I'm concerned that I think all the way through we're concerned about um, community engagement and making sure that all members or all, all um, sections of the public are able to access what was going on because it is quite significant changes so I think if we can you can report back to the commission or, or send us a briefing paper saying this is how many people attended the meeting and the general public because it'd be interesting to see what feedback we get. I mean I can I can tell you numbers now because I know them but um I, I mean if you, if you want me to supply something a bit greater but essentially the information's all in the public domain anyway it's right, on the okay. website for the right. South East London CCG so they're including I think that's the way into the borough information right. as well right. both um uh today's meeting will have been recorded the borough based board isn't the recording isn't available um but it was streamed live there were about eight members of the public for the borough based board meeting okay. and there were about 40 today for the south east london ccg um and and a key agenda item for last week's was about community public uh, patient engagement um and there is a south east london engagement strategy which talks very much about the importance of, of involving the public in decision making so um there is quite a lot out there but i guess um could, could you would you follow up with a few specific questions and we'll certainly put something together or directly to the bits on the website okay that'd be possible jeanette do you want to add anything no okay no. So jeanette um, was at the borough based board last week so we'll have also been aware of some of the the engagement side of it. Okay, Helen, you've got you want to ask a quick question. Was that on the um, um, the care the care easement act, or did you want oh, to no, ask sorry. question to Nancy? I had a question for Nancy. Just on this quick. Yeah, question. okay. If you want um, to ask a question to Nancy, do you do you envisage kind of any impact on any joint on joint commissioning arrangements that the council and CCG had, like for example, the joint commissioning that had been. Um, proposed around mental health or I mean does that just now essentially sit at the at the borough board level um, and kind of continue as as was plans or are there any risks around um, how we do joint commissioning? So so the intention of the merger and the changes has always been to end up with a more integrated approach to commissioning and across the six boroughs each borough has a different level of maturity of that so for example Lambeth has has a high level of integration with its local authority and we have a lower and as part of the process there's been a um some facilitated developments to look at how we integrate so we we've, we've we've had various well well one i suppose tested model before which was reviewed um and we've built on that to to certainly have ideas about how we do this and alongside with um the development of the provider alliance so the, the partnership partnership southwark which is our local care provider alliance so um it's a, it's a, it's absolutely what the you know if we're going to get the most out of this it's absolutely something that needs to take place is the integration so there's going to be recruitment to a joint team um 
obviously joint objectives based on the five year forward view, the joint for, forward view from Southwark, the, the joint mental health strategy you referenced. So we're certainly on that journey and, and part of our meeting programme is, is to have a develop, sort of development meetings alongside the governance meetings. I mean, Jeanette, you might have something to add as well if you want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to add to that. So um, I, I think um, uh, Nancy's right. We are looking uh, where possible to ensure that we have borough based commissioning so that we have uh, commissioning as close as possible and services designed as close as possible to the community. Um, there are risks because, of course, uh, there are economies of scale for health colleagues in terms of having six boroughs come together. Um, and so I think it's about how we make sure that where that happens, where, where it's felt that that's best in terms of um, uh, perhaps in terms of service delivery, that we still have something that is delivered locally uh, that, that reflects what we need in the borough. Uh, I think mental health is a good example of that because I know that we have um, not just in the six boroughs, but, but wider, the South London Commissioning Partnership that um, is being led by the um, uh, by SLAM and others. So, uh, so we do. So we just need to be always mindful as commissioners about uh, where it's right to do something on our own and where it's um, more appropriate to do something together, whether it's with our neighbouring boroughs or on a, on a sub-regional basis like South East London. Your, your mic's off. Is, yeah, just is there any other questions for any other members? So Nancy? No, yes, no. OK, thank you for that. Um, can we go to item eight? Is that you and Jeanette? Care home, extra care quality assurance. So I thought this was, sorry, Chair, I thought this was your report, Julie. All right, um, OK, sorry. Oh, no, that's OK. Well, sorry. Um, we've got the briefings from that. Go, if go to um, um, item nine. Julie, is that right? Because I'm just looking at the agenda. Yeah, so item nine is the uh, care that's homes support. report. That's right. Um, I think I think possibly uh, Nancy might say was was going to say something um, about the commissioning of services. There's there's something in the slide, actually which sums that up as well. Um, I can get that up on screen if that's helpful, Nancy, or? Um, yes, please. Uh, it was was, me a was that for item eight? Was that for item eight, Julie? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, because I haven't got anything attached there. So I, um, I think my expectation here was that we, um, I think I think some of my colleagues did supply some extra information, and um, you you updated your report, mm. which I think was um, a good read. And so I was really going to just yeah answer questions. Um, so yeah, I put I put that longer information up. Can you see it on yeah. my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Only, only a few lines because obviously it's a few lines. Okay. Page, but you were asking a bit about how GP services were provided. I can talk about that, or I d uh, yeah. I mean, uh, do, do members want to ask questions specifically? Because I think this is what came up at the end of the last meeting. I or I can get that. I can only um, I, I can only see a few lines. So. Yeah. Sorry, um, I'm struggling a little bit here. Um, I see if I can go down. Um, is that is that better? Can you see yeah. more? Yeah. Yeah. Should I go through it slowly? Would that be helpful? Um, I mean, I well, okay. So my my take on this is that there was a very detailed report that you produced at the last meeting and and has been updated, and I think it's much clearer as to how quality is assured and I think you were asking specifically about when the CCG commissioned care home services and what how we assure ourselves of their quality is that the, the ask so I 
and I and I and I'm not going to attempt to outline the whole lot. I think it is all in your in the um, broader wider report that you shared, and I'm going to just get that one because I've got it on my. Um, is, is that the report? QA. Is that our draft report on care homes? Yeah, the CHQA yeah. headline report. I felt okay. that you had added several sections where um, where it was relevant. This this reading through what you've just described is literally what's commissioned for the in terms of general practice and the right. multidisciplinary team, which I can briefly talk about. Um, so good model of care practice for, for care homes is to have a multidisciplinary team so so that you have a dedicated service for um, and it works better if it's all care homes over a patch rather than each care home having a different service or a different GP surgery. So there was um, an invitation to tender for that and uh, Key Health Solutions, which is the North Southwark GP Federation, won that and I think have been running services for about two to three years now. There we go. Is that what? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Um, and in addition to GPs and, and other usual practice staff, so people like um, pharmacists, um, healthcare assistants, nurses, there's also um, some input from um, the hospital elderly care team, palliative care, dietitians, etc. So this is the they um, can can work together, coordinate care. Um, a lot of it is to do with staff training and, and enabling staff to make decisions as well, particularly when to escalate, when to use out of hour services. So um, each of the professionals in the multiple disciplinary team will come from their own organization which and and their performance quality is assured in the in the way that those organizations usually are but then this is a specific contract um, between CCG and care home just to make sure that the um, the kind of key focus is that the, the care home and the, the clients in it so I think the CCG will monitor on that contract it's actually more about the how the individual professionals um, are performing within their own organisations, I think, that provides the assurance. If that makes sense. Okay. Any members got any questions or should we just go straight to the draft report and go through that? Yeah, should we just go straight to the report? Okay, um, go to the next item and um, that's, we go to item nine, that's the, the latest version of, of our draft report of the care homes. And obviously we've, we've taken on board a lot of what members said last at the last meeting last month about changing some recommendations, tightening it, making it more specific. So I don't know if people want to literally, if people have had a chance to have a look at that, they want to add their comments or suggestions because we have actually tweaked it and obviously added Nancy's information, a lot of other information as well. Any comments from anybody? Members, no? Jeanette? Thank you, Chair. I wasn't sure if there, there seems to be some questions in the report. So okay. for example, on okay. page 47, it asks, it um, makes a statement. Yeah, sorry. Uh, page oh. 47, um, the headline is um, background nursing homes too. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm Sorry, I've got these slide numbers because I'm looking at the online version. Okay. Apologies. Is it, back, is it background nursing homes too? That's it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, which bullet point? Thank so it's, it's the it's the bullet point with purple font in it. So it's the penultimate bullet point. Okay. It says, um, however, it is unclear how the number of beds will increase from one one five to 260 in 2020 um and and i'm not i suppose it would be helpful to have a conversation with um who, what, why that's not clear uh because that's this i presume this is referring to the gateway one which yeah. does talk about the fact that we intend to have access to a, a home which has up to last year was block booked by lambeth but we're working okay. with them to have access to those beds uh, and in fact, that is something that is happening and has continued to happen in spite of the lockdown. Okay. Um, so so I, I don't know if it's uh, for me to propose uh, some wording to clarify that. OK, 
that that would really help because then that would firm up that point because at the, I think at the time when we wrote that we weren't clear about how you, that was going to increase but I mean now in 2020 so obviously you've just said that so that you know if you can send that to us then we could add that to the report mm -hmm. is there anything else any other parts of the report Jeanette you wanted to comment on or uh, no, uh, not at this time no thank you chair okay any other comments from any other uh, members about the report like we said this is about version six now we're slowly getting there david noakes sorry uh, david this week, we? come back on again um i mean are we are we gonna just maybe go through the recommendations just yeah should we go is that probably the best way to proceed yeah let, let oh. me all right so let me oh gosh that that's julie this week. Hey. Let, Yes, would you like me to go through them? Um, yeah. I think they're on different pages, aren't they? They're not all in the same. They are, yes. On so different pages. We might have to scroll through them and see where there's a recommendation. I can try to help as well. I've got my other. So. Just to flag up, there's some extra information on this slide 13. Can you all see it? I'm showing 13. Yeah. But Jeanette, Jeanette has sent through some extra information so we can. Uh, by email, so we can um, include that in the final report, a summary of that final report. Um, okay, so if we say recommend right, recommendations. Um, I'm yeah, make, just trying to find the recommendations. The first one I can see is slide 18 at the bottom of quality alerts. That one there, that's the first one I can see. Yeah. Quality alerts and complaints. Um, that's up on the screen now, hopefully. Oh, quality alerts and complaints, yeah. David, do you want to comment from the recommendations from, yeah, because I've got a different page, quality alerts and complaints three, or is it specific recommendations you wanted to talk about, David? Um, I just thought it might be useful for us just to all see them again, just so that yeah. if there's any final comments we want to make. or um... Yeah, because if, yeah, if we look at um, the recommendations, I'm just thinking if this um, if this one's actually changed. Do, 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 do. All home, yeah. Yeah, because I think this recommendation, the first one, all homes accounts CCG, because last time it wasn't as spe specific. It was just saying about complaint process, but now we've actually tightened it up by saying the council CCG have a complaints quality and safeguarding process. That that's the change. Um, um, because at the time we we didn't think we had a process of if somebody was it wasn't clear about if a resident was unhappy with the outcome, what would happen then? Um, I suppose my only ongoing yeah. question is, um, I'm still not 100% clear that, that to what extent, I believe it's meant to be in their contracts, but I'm, I'm not totally clear how uh, well displayed or, or accessible the complaints process is in the homes. Uh, okay. Jeanette, could, could you respond to that or? Or, or, or is it more a case of each provider have to have their own complaints process and we as a council will only check it through the contract monitoring and how does it work? You're on mute, Jeanette. You're on mute. Apologies. Um, so all care homes need to have a complaints process. That's part of the CQC regulation. Uh, I think your specific question is around how that's promoted with the family and the residents. Is that is that right, Councillor yeah. Knight? Okay. So um, it's expected to be part of the starter pack. It should be displayed on on the notice boards. Um, we would expect that um, that the care staff uh, would be promoting it as well as and when people uh, express any dissatisfaction with the service. And that's something that we monitor as part of the contract monitoring by looking at their records of complaints. So um, just as we'd, you'd expect, we'd be concerned if they had an awful lot of complaints, we'd be concerned if they didn't have very many um, because we would expect that to be all be recorded. Um, very happy for you to perhaps uh, put in the recommendation about being more assured about how we monitor that or more robust um but, but that's that's how we do it now. Um, when our officers go around or to check on the homes you know whether there's anything like a checklist thing that we can do to to make sure that a that the complaints process and you know and that we are monitoring how many complaints come in for each home but maybe there's some process put in place um so yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm still not 100% sure that it's working as well as it should do everywhere. It feels a bit like it's up to each home to 
decide how much they promote. And I just wondered, is there not more we can do um, when we're placing people into the homes to make sure that, you know, that, yeah, it is on the notice boards and that uh, we are checking every six months or every 12 months to see how many complaints have been made? So because we're visiting at least quarterly um, the homes, uh, we I would expect that they do that. Uh, it, I think I did share with you some examples of reports um, that they use, in, in, yeah. which have prompts in them, and it does talk about complaints in there. Uh, but um, uh, I, I, I suppose what I could do is, is talk to the team about how we, we are, um, make that something as a, a, a focus um in terms of the visits over the coming year so that we can give uh, perhaps think about how we could do that in a more systemized way for reporting back we did talk in one of the recommendations about um about having an annual report on care homes and we could ensure that that has a section which would therefore mean we'd have to collect that information if, that, if that's helpful yeah i think that would definitely be yeah useful. i think I think if you look at um, some of the later recommendations, it picks up what Jeanette was saying about in the annual care report, we pick up um, key issues about complaints, safeguarding other things. That's the additional recommendation we've put in. So if there's an annual care report, um, report that, that's to be checked every year, because I don't know if it's been done before. So I think that's one of the additional recommendations we put further down. Thank you. Yeah, did you want me to stay here or move on? Yeah, if you move on. Could, can I just add something? Um, yes, Nancy. Is it, is Nancy, it the, sorry. the approach we want is that there's a sort of no wrong, wrong front door for a complaint, isn't it? You, you Because a, the average carer relative is not going to necessarily know enough about how all the different services come together to fund a bed or to to, to provide the care. So it's it, 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 that's what it feels important to me is that there's no wrong wrong front door. So if if the home is approached about a problem that's actually because of the behaviour of a GP or nurse um, from the QHS service, then they need to be able to, to, to find it a seamless process to give their yeah. feedback. And similarly, if they go to the CCG, because there's a, you know, the CCG, the council have publicised complaints procedures, but it's actually about the care, the home itself and oh, its own yeah. internal. It's just that there needs to be a no wrong front door. Um, and and I think as a as I suppose as a partnership of commissioners, we need to just make sure that we're we're we, you know we're supporting that really. Yeah, I I think we are trying to do that, but also I think what David's picking up is that we're trying to um, there's an assumption that you know um, um, families um, service users, families, friends um, know how to complain and who do they complain to, and I think we just might make it clear that that it's quite um, a simple process and if it's at home because we've had um, um, people in the past who've complained about a particular, <clears throat> a particular provision within Southwark and, and that person was very frustrated about um, because it just seemed to be a complaint process with the provider who's reviewing themselves and it was a case of that person was frustrated about well hang on a minute the provider are not going to find problem with their provision so where do I take it to and she felt frustrated that the council and somebody else didn't pick it up so it's making sure that that doesn't happen again but it's making sure that families are clear that if they're going to a provider um, are they going to be supported by the council or CCG or whoever to make sure that they're just not going around in circles with this one um, you know social care provider who's not going to give them the answers they want and stuff. Jeanette, you had your hand up or was that from a previous? Uh, I think I you had hand up. No. no, it's all right because I saw a raised hand. Oh. So um, do you want to go to the next um, page of recommendations, Julie? Yeah. I think that's um, Family Friends Advocacy number three. OK, so this is more about um, sort of 70 percent of people who of getting provision out of borough. Um, I suppose the, the second recommendation there, um, you know, is the assumption that care homes will have regular meetings with families and carers. Um, if it's quarterly, obviously that might fit in to <clears throat> fit into what uh, contract monitoring are doing with Jeanette and whatever anyway. We think we, we're saying it ought to happen quarterly. I mean, because I think the impression that we've given that sometimes it doesn't happen that often. So we're just putting it as a recommendation that it should happen quarterly and there should be a schedule 
and it fit in because then when contract monitoring uh, officers go in, they can check and say, OK, when was the last meeting? <clears throat> and what were some of the things that came out from that? Um, I don't know if, the, sorry, my voice is going now. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. David, I see your hand up. Okay. Um, I mean, I like the idea of the first recommendation about ensuring systems are in place to ensure that people in homes in and out of Southwark are on branded out support. But um, I think I raised this last time, I'm just a little bit unsure about how will we know who doesn't uh, have relative, how will the independent lay and advocacy service know who doesn't doesn't have relatives and uh, additional support um and if it's not going to be done by that i just don't know what the scale of that ask is in a sense so i don't know how many people in care homes don't have any relatives or friends visiting them yeah i mean are we talking about half the people in the homes or are we talking about a quarter um i mean maybe we don't have to come up with all the answers maybe we just have yeah. to put recommendations in but uh because uh, i think it's an important thing about you know I, we we, ha we took evidence from people who are you know from relatives who clearly are looking after the interests of their, of their loved ones yeah when people don't have anyone visiting them then i guess there's always that concern that maybe their interests are not being you know been heard fully addressed or um but so, I, but yeah. i thought that recommendation is just trying to pick that up and so at least then it's a recommendation and then it might be a case of <clears throat> later on the next house scrutiny can say how we're we going to do that but at least if if it's down on paper it's the start of that conversation you know that's if we haven't done it before now we should start doing it let's think about what's the best way to do it yeah no that's fine uh, can i just get clarity though I, do we have any sort of um what is or maybe jeanette can say what what exactly is our responsibility for people who are in care homes outside of the borough i mean presumably if there was a major problem with a home we would stop um, placing people there, but I mean, do we have any sort of ongoing responsibilities for those outside the borough? Yeah, so, um, so I've answered your, que your, your last question, but, but go back to some of the points you, you were asking at the beginning about uh, unbefriended and knowing who's unbefriended as well, uh, Councillor Noakes. Uh, so, so starting with the question of our responsibility to people out of borough, where where the council has placed someone out of borough they remain our responsibility and that's why the social worker will continue to go out and visit uh, and that's why we keep in close contact with the host authority for that particular care home um probably important to say that uh, in terms of unbefriended um uh, service users where they are funded by the council, we will know who's unbefriended because that will have been part of their overall assessment. Yeah. Um, so we would be able to uh, identify who the lay inspectors should be contacting and, and focusing on, and that's that would be our intention. Uh, and I, I just I just wonder because there's been uh, I think some of the um, there's a bit of a golden thread in some of the questions being asked about um, what a care home should do in terms of holding regular meetings, having complaints and so on. These are things that are embedded in the CQC regulations. And so, you know, depending on how well homes perform, that relates to their CQC rating. Now, of course, there is, um, uh, depending on the rating of a home, a lack of frequency in how that's monitored. Uh, and that's why we as council um, commissioners are, are visiting more regularly to ensure that the um, the quality is maintained or improving depending on where a home is in terms of its journey in, in terms of quality um, but it, I, I just thought it's important to say that as well if that's okay okay thank you um, do we need to go Julie do you want to go down to the next set of recommendations please um, So that's lay inspections for. So I think this is a recognition that um, a summary of their work needs to be included in the annual report on care homes. So at least then everyone's aware of <clears throat> everyone's aware of what the lay inspection project is and what it's actually doing. Because obviously the new revised project um, from Age UK, um, Lambeth and Southwark. Um, we did we did get some feedback from the new CEO, I think a few months ago, who was saying that he was actually going to tweak how that lay inspection project is going to work to feed into contract monitoring and 
and uh, the usual thing because because I think Jeanette was saying it was a bit standalone but at least it can feed in it's like they said we did we can hear directly from family and service users families about um the, i'd say the softer feedback more informal feedback which could help um make sure and pick up maybe some early warnings or some early issues from families before they become formal complaints <clears throat> um sorry my voice is going here um the next one would be strategic mem member oversight And I think this is just the um, recommendation that we do have an annual cabinet report on care homes would be a useful addition because in the assumption that um, I don't know if we've done one before, but this would summarise everything that we're doing now. Um, and it's quite self-explanatory, sorry, <clears throat> summary of complaints, quality alerts, benchmarking, um, and hopefully benchmarking with comparative local authorities if possible, but at least if there's an annual cabinet report, um, with folks non care homes, it's not just because it's topical now, it's just a continuing thread that the council will focus. You know, it won't be a case of care homes, is, you know, it's a poor relations and we're only dealing with it in 2020. We'll continue looking at that and making sure that what we're doing for, for purpose. Um, let's see, is there any other recommendation? Sorry, did somebody say something? Hello? Yeah, okay, would you Do like me to move on? Yeah, yes, please. I'm just looking myself. I think the next one is the addendum COVID-19-3. Because that's been changed. Recommend, OK, conclusions two. Um, can everybody see that? Because I think, um, if you zoom it up. Yeah. Yeah, because what we've done is, if you see it in purple, purple is the additional um, because following on for a meeting last month, we put additional recommendations in. <clears throat> Gosh, I can't believe my voice is going. Oh, that's no good. That's mm. too big. Yeah. About 100%. Okay. All right. Because um, we're saying a more detailed program ought to be put in place to monitor and support people placed out uh, of borough placements. I think. <clears throat> I think that's referring back to what Jeanette was saying about the support you give to people out of borough. I think it's just, I think as as um, as a commission, we wanted a detailed program. Is that this is how you actually do it? Um, you know, you you check, you probably do as much support as people within the borough. But I think it's just having it written down in detail so we're quite clear about what that program is. Um, let me have a look. And also we added recommendations about um, um, particular focus for local people with more challenging dementia, because I think we haven't talked about people with um, addition, additional needs with dementia, because we were just talking about people in care homes or whatever, but we're thinking the far more vulnerable um, members of our community. And also, uh, uh, and we added, added another recommendation about lobby government to bring forward the expected white paper on social care funding. I think across the industry, everyone's concerned about that funding hasn't been brought through, but make sure that it is funded because I think we as a council with everybody else have to push a national government for that white paper to show us because social funding needs to be funded rather than just the 1.5 billion they've given us recently because of the COVID. Um, I think the next one would be addendum COVID-19-13. Sorry, Chair, can I just Sorry. jump in? Sorry. Jeanette, about, yeah. Sorry. Um, <coughs> so I, I'm quite passionate about the, the, the second bullet point. I wonder if that, um, if, if you might consider as a committee thinking about the residential care charter, uh, that it reflects our ambitions of the residential care charter which is about a fair you know um uh, uh april ashley who presented last time talked about yeah. you know we want more than a clap we want you know london living wage we want okay. so I, I just wonder whether it might be worth um just fleshing that out a little bit what the expedite the plans for expansion that one no the the, the in terms of the a fair settlement for social care funding okay. uh, talking about what what we think that should look like in terms of how the workforce is is recognized and and funded um in terms of being paid so reflecting the fact that the council has a commitment to the london living wage we've got a council plan commitment to have a residential care charter that reflects our ethical care charter for home care so 
I just, I just wonder if, if it might yeah. be helpful to do that, um, to, to strengthen our lobbying to government. Julie, do you want to add a line for that? Because I thought we have referred to, referred to ethical care charters later on in the report, but did you want to add, do you think it's a good idea we add it there or? I, I think that does make sense, Chair. I mean, yeah. there is, there, uh, that would, um, I just flicked down to the, the last, um, the additional um, recommendation Fiction. about the or home care charter, which seems does actually to say that another yeah, page, doesn't it? It does say that, but I think Jeanette's point is that that this recommendation, if I'm understanding correctly, also ought to reflect um, Southwark's commitment to um, the local, the living wage, and presumably sick pay. Hey. And I might say that it to strengthen this rec recommendation. I think this suggests we could add a line that in lobbying government that we also ensure that there is provision that that the workforce is is recompensed um according to living wage or something yeah like that. yeah and sick pay is always covered or yeah i'm sure because, we could say something a bit better than that but um yeah. but because it's because it's also mentioned in um later recommendations two slides down but obviously i think yeah. we, could, we can put it in there isn't it nancy did you want to say something i think you've got your hand up Yes, and all the raised hands at the moment. Um, it's there's two things. One is just look a bit more about the dementia support. Um, I don't know if you're aware that public health did a limited needs assessment last year on prevention of dementia. So they they would have talked a little bit about um, people already in placements. The mental joint mental health and wellbeing strategy has a section on it. Um, there is input to train care workers. Uh, there's CQC expectations about um, skills for dementia and there's also a CCD commissioned care home intervention team with the Maudsley Trust in, in dementia. So I think currently we've got quite, a, I'd say, a reasonable awareness of the needs and a response to it. Obviously, there's, there's future planning, which is based on population change. Also, I'm aware of a paper, I don't know if about, you know about this, Jeanette, called the ADAS LHB social care paper, which came to me via SAM, which came, I think, via the, um, the, the, the group of adult social care directors across the South East London, which is quite a nice one in terms of response to COVID and the lessons learned and issues arising and, and some kind of recommendations for the future. I don't know if that's, it's, it's mainly to do with COVID, which I know I think is there's a bit on a future slide. I think it's shareable, but I, I might check with Sam and then sh share it with you. Do you think that would be welcome? Yeah, that would, yeah, that would yeah. be helpful. Would you like me to go through the uh, rest of the slides? Yes, that please. One? Yeah. Because I think what we're trying to do by the end of this meeting is agree um, the report as much as possible and with just some slight amendments. Um, see, this is the one I was saying about addendum COVID-19-3. Um, about the recommendations there. I think all those recommendations are, are new ones, are they? Because they're in purple? Uh, yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's any comments from any members. David, have you still got your hand up from before or you wanted to ask a question now? You've got your hands uh, raised. Um, yes, I, I was, well, I was going to just say that I thought the, um, going back to a point, I thought the lobbying of the government to finally come up with a, a proper way of funding social care is, is absolutely something we should be doing because uh, yeah. yeah, I think uh, COVID-19 has again exposed the weakness of our systems and uh, particularly the financial viability of some of our homes. And uh, so it really should be in the uh, urgent tray, I think, to sort out. Um, OK. Good. OK, so that recommendation stay. Um, anybody want to comment on the recommendations for the addendum COVID-19-13? Because we've, we've mentioned about ethical home care charter by September, uh, requirement for sick pay. I mean, you know, um, so they could use that anyway, plan to put, manage a second wave and risk of further fatalities by ensuring PPE testing. I know that Jeanette, but also Nancy's talked, I mean, talked about all the partners getting ready for a second wave. And if it did happen, you know, making sure the resources are in place. Um, but also additional one, rolling out key worker status to families and things in care homes. Um, because because I think the, there was an article, um, I think I think I'd read some. Um, some family and friends were saying they were concerned about having no access or very limited access to their um, 
their relatives more isolated. Um, and that refers to article respect for your private, private and family home. So that's additional recommendations because there's been recent articles about, you know, people with extra vulnerabilities and dementia um, need far more support. Gosh, my voice has completely gone, sorry. Um, Julie, did you want to? I think that's the final, that was the final um, list of recommendations. Was there any more? David, you still got your hand up or was that from previously? Uh, so I think that's from previously. Okay. Is there any other comments from members about the report? Because this, this is probably, as I said, draft number six, and I think we've nearly got there. So I don't know if we can, could we agree in principle um, this report at, with some slight tweaks? Members, if you say yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. David, Maria, yeah. Charlie, Maria. Yes. Darren. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thank you. OK. Um, if we can go to um, the work program, item number. I'm just looking. I'm going to sign off now. Sorry. That's all right, Victoria. Okay, thank you, Nancy, and thank Thanks you for your for contributions. Me. I'm sure we'll Bye. be in contact soon. Bye. And um, Victoria. Sorry. Hi, yeah. Hi, Helen. Sorry, um, Helen. Forgot you there. Just a quick question. I don't know if any officers are on um, who would be able to respond to a very quick question on the social um, on the Care Act easements. I don't. I'm trying to think who's here. Um, could, no, no, I don't, no, no, no. It could just anyone. be um, a point of in, like a question for information that maybe we could just write um, and just get confirmation to the cabinet okay. member. Um, okay. My understanding was that we haven't had to implement any of those easements. Yeah, that's what council. that's what Jeanette said. We yeah. yeah, okay, fine. That's all I wanted to yeah. clarify. No, I remember Jeanette said that in the last meeting, the meeting before when we face yeah, to face, yeah. and we never had but to. I just do wanted because I know it's based on the capacity that we've got to, you know, undertake kind of full assessments, etc. Yeah. And I just wanted to make sure that was still the case. Thanks. Yeah, because so, yeah. remember Je Jeanette did say that, and David said that. Um, so, do we want to? Um, if we're going to go to um, item 10, work programme. Julie, is that right? Yeah. I'm just looking at that. So if you, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, sorry. Were you going to say something? Um, no, I, I, I can try and put it up if you'd like, um, unless everybody's got access to it. Has, has everybody got access to it in the agenda? Okay. Because it's clearly just confirming what we've done so far, and it's just whatever's whatever's going to be carried over would be. Um, <clears throat> so there is one thing to flag up just about the date um, that it would be good if we could agree um, the final date for this administrative year, which is uh, scheduled to be the 9th of September. September. Okay. Um, members could. Could we agree on that date provisionally? Because that would wrap up the second part, which would basically the review of the mental health of children and young people, all the officers' briefings, and that's just focus on, if you look at it, officers' briefings on um, impact of COVID. Um, because it's like Maria said to you, point B, can you see that impact of COVID on health and well-being of children, and young people, including domestic abuse? Can you see that, Maria? Just getting that up on Sorry. the screen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then obviously, yeah, then, that, uh, chair. there is also one thing um, that I did um, that, that was due to go on here that was previously agreed, which is yeah. to have the interview with the um, the cabinet lead no, for no. public health as well. That was previously yeah. agreed. Yeah, it was Evelyn Okoto, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, sorry, it's chair. Are you suggesting that there'll be a just one final meeting in September? Is that is that what you're saying? Because when I think so because because we've done most of the, the care report, but um, the final meeting in September would focus on the mental health, and that because because we haven't really looked at that in much detail. Because I think obviously with because um, we were going to have different visits and whatever, and I think with COVID nineteen, it's pushed things back. Or were you, were you thinking that we could have more than one more meeting, David? What were you thinking? No, no, I was just wondering if if we're having one final meeting of this municipal year, whether, is, are we suggesting that Evelyn could come to that in September as well or not? Yeah, I think that, that's a good suggestion. Julie, could we do that? Yes, and um, I think if I, she's available, that would be the plan. Um, yes, if that's if, that, if you still wanted to take forward that um, 
that recommendation I think was agreed a couple of months ago. Yeah. But I can certainly ask her if she's available if you'd like me to. I think. <clears throat> I mean, I think COVID nineteen yeah. possible second wave. I think um, public health yeah. is very much at the forefront of our thinking at the moment. So I think it would be quite useful to. Yeah. Especially um, yeah, but, September. Yeah. Marie, do you want to say something? Yes, please. Um, yeah. You said the 9th of September. I cannot do the 9th of September because I, I got licensing committee in the evening. Okay. Yeah, and also, I think we've got a Labour group that evening. Okay. It's penciled in. It's penciled in, isn't it? Okay, let me. I can do the check. 8th and I can do the, the 10th. Um, I think I seem to remember that the tenth would be much better if that's possible because um, yeah you're right Darren because we've got Labour group meeting now so shall we move it to the tenth the Thursday that, the tenth that will be great that will be great yeah uh, so I'm just picking out uh, my diary yeah tenth looks okay yeah so why don't we say thanks Darren yeah because why don't we say the tenth because 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 that, that's a lot easier on the Thursday isn't it the Thursday the tenth of September yeah perfect so that would be that's final with then Okay, I've just put that in my diary. So, so if we can agree that, and then um, is there any other business for anybody? Uh, no, chair. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So if no, okay. So if we can close the meeting and we'll and we could we we'll sign. If there's any final adjustments, I think that we can sign off the report. Um, we'll have our final meeting on the 10th of September, not the 9th of September. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you all and good night. Thanks. Yeah. You, Joe. Look after you. Well Look after yourself, everyone. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. 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 Bye.